Hello, baseball fans, and welcome to this episode of A Visit to the Mound. I'm Lark Smith, along with Stan Huff. Today we have a special guest for this episode as we talk with former Texas Ranger Rusty Greer. Rusty spent 15 years in the Rangers organization after the club selected him in the 10th round of the 1990 amateur draft. He was called up to the big leagues in 1994 and became a fan favorite because of his hustling style of play. Injuries limited his playing time over his last two seasons and precipitated his retirement after the 2002 season. But with a career batting average of 305 and outstanding defensive play, he was inducted into the Texas Rangers Hall of Fame on August the 11th of 2007. Rusty, thank you for your time today. We know you're still very busy with the game of baseball as you were coaching at the college level back in your home state of Alabama. How did that particular opportunity come about for you? Well, I'm glad to be here today, Lark. It's, uh, well, I'll tell you this. I, I've wanted to get in the college game for a while. I love amateur baseball. Um, whether it's 10-year-old baseball, high school, college, it doesn't matter. I just like amateur baseball. I uh, wanted to get in the college game for a while, and but because of uh, timing issues, meaning, well, and you know Mason. Mason, I'm chasing him, watching his games, and uh, my other kids doing their deal. So I wanted to see them grow up and, and do what they did. But them being... Uh, grown for all intents and purposes. Now, Mason's still Missouri State, but I, I told my wife, if I'm ever going to uh, get into the game, I need to I need to try to do it now. And uh, since because I, at the time I was 53, and uh, even though I'm full of energy, my window was is beginning to close. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and so I reached out to some guys over in that area um, that are head coaches and, and uh, talked to them about potentially volunteering and. That, that didn't work out, so I, uh, through a mutual friend, um, actually my former agent, uh, a guy named Bo McKenna, he knew uh, Coach Jim Case over here at Jacksonville State University uh, in Jacksonville, Alabama. And so Bo reached out to Coach Case, and, and he said, uh, absolutely, love to, have him, love to have you on the staff. You're bringing a lot to the program. However, <clears throat> my staff's full, and the only way I could make that happen is that you come back as a graduate assistant. Um, so I initially threw up at that idea from because I hadn't been in school in 30 years. <laughs> and uh, I've got my undergraduate, and so graduate school was, was there. I told him, no, I didn't want to do that. I thought about it for a couple of days, got a little counsel from my wife, and uh, I told her, you know, it's, it's almost like somebody was saying, how bad do you really want to do this? Uh -huh. And so I called him back two days later and said, I'm in registered for school and uh, I'm a graduate assistant at Jacksonville State University and so uh, I'm learning a lot I mean, uh, you guys have been great to me over here um, uh, you're just going through a collegiate uh, you know fall and, and spring now and uh, so learning a lot and hopefully put that in my memory bank and take it forward with me uh, what is uh, what division is Jacksonville State our Division One uh, school in the A Sun Conference actually moving to Conference USA next year. I see. Okay. Um, so, so yes. Yeah, so we actually we're playing uh, <laughs> Sellerman this weekend in the conference uh, conference series. So, uh, yeah, Division One school, and, and ultimately I want to be a head coach somewhere, and, and uh, I think that that's the driving force behind any anything that I do to try to try to get somewhere where I can implement some things that I've learned and, and go forward. Now, this is not necessarily your first foray into college coaching. Uh, didn't you help your former teammate Mike Jeffcoat at Texas Wesleyan at one point? I did. I helped him out there for a year, and, and uh, that kind of got my feet wet. And that's kind of where I fell in love with uh, the college game. Uh, you know, players are still <clears> – <throat> they're, they're, they want to be successful on their own, but it's still a team environment. I'm a, I'm a big college uh, – I believe in the college experience, just from an individual standpoint, going to school and and uh, being a part of, of, of a fraternity, so to speak, in the baseball program. And uh, I believe in the rah-rah and the whole nine yards. And, <laughs> and so I got my, my feel there. Um, well, I didn't get my feel. I got my, my first taste there. Um, but, but like I said, because of timing, um, it, it, was, it wasn't right to, to try to continue on. And then uh, where we are now, the timing's better. And so... Uh, that's that's where I'm at right now. Well, you've also been involved in some baseball instruction in the Dallas area. What age group have you been instructing, and, and what's been the area of focus? Um, area of focus is Rusty Grove Baseball School. Area of focus is defense. Um, and for me, uh, I, I didn't – everybody 
considers me a hitter and uh, and, and I can teach hitting and I'm, I'm fairly I'm fairly good at it but my true passion is defense and, and teaching uh, to be honest with you infield defense and uh, people people ask well, you're a left-handed outfielder how did how does that work mm-hmm. and so well and and for two years and change I uh, in the minor leagues um, I spent with Perry Hill um, who Perry, is yeah. Yeah, he's he's with the he's with the Mariners and and has been in know him you well. know, the big leagues forever. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, I, I spent two years with him learning to play first base. I I went to two instructional leagues, uh, uh, two years in Double A, and actually played. I'm I'm guessing not I'm guessing ten or twelve games at first base in the big leagues my rookie year. And so what I would do is because you know he was the rover back then and. Uh, he would come in uh, for once a week uh, or, or once a month for a week, and each position would have to go out and do their individual work and their early work. And so it's the first base, and I'd go out and do my work. Well, he would bring the second baseman out on, let's say, Tuesday. Well, I'd go out, and I'd be his catch guy. And then the same thing at shortstop, same thing at third. And because I actually thought to myself, you know, I may want to be a coach one day. And, and at the time, I said, I think this guy's pretty good. And it, that's turned out to be true. So mm-hmm. I'm going to go listen to him. And so I I, uh, I just listened and absorbed everything he said. And, and then when I started uh, my school and teaching uh, teaching the defensive side of baseball, as I say, um, I, I kind of Im- implemented what I learned from him um, in teaching kids. And my wheelhouse with the kids were 10 to 13. And I've had, you know, I've had 8-year-olds come in. Um, I've had 18-year-olds come in. But the wheelhouse was my 10 to 13s and, and – Believe it or not, man, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, there's some <clears throat> there's some really good players at that age level, um, and, and all they need is a little bit of uh, instruction, uh, a ton of patience, and, and stick-to-itiveness uh, from somebody to teach them, and they'll give you everything they got. I, I got to tell you, you're, you're on to something right there. You know, more of these, uh, these uh, in my experience, the more of these select uh, organizations or travel ball teams they're more about winning tournaments than development and the development part is really where everything is and you're on the right track there as far as I'm concerned I've, I got to give you high marks for that too well I appreciate it. well you know it's it's uh it, it's something that I and mean, I actually was giving at the time I was giving hitting lessons and I was in a, in a cage and I was sitting there one night and uh, I had a struct- and another instructor on my right and one on my left, and I'm listening. I had a break for, for 30 minutes, and I was listening. And I, w- I was just, at the time, I'd been in the cage for about five hours. I was cage blind from the nets, and, and I was just listening. I understand. Uh, I've what been was there. going on, you know? Yeah, you know, you've been there. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. When yeah. Nobody knows what I mean when I'm cage blind, but yeah, they, you know exactly what I mean. Yeah. Um, and, and so I'm listening, and I'm hearing – I'm hearing multiple things come out of you know my mouth, somebody else's mouth, everything else, and I, I started thinking, where are we missing the boat with youth youth players? Um, and, and it hit me. I said, defense. Nobody teaches defense. Everybody wants to do pitching and hitting, um, but nobody teaches defense. And so right then and there, I said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going I'm to drop the hitting. Um, I'm going to go start teaching defense. And, and the thing that I did was I did everything live and outside. Um, so we learned, um, we learned, we didn't learn through drills, so, uh, so to speak, we learned through live application and, and my hands were on everything that was there. Um, uh, it was a do it over, do it again, do it again, do it again until we got it right. And one thing that I did a little bit different is my, my stuff was small group, uh, position specific. So if we had a middle infield camp going, there was a three-day camp. There was 14 guys there, and we learned to play the middle infield. Well, on Thursday, Friday, let's say we had a first base camp. There was 12 guys at the first base camp, and we learned to play first base. Um, and we went for four hours a day, um, uh, and, and I packed a lot of information in on them. And from year to year to year to year, kids would come back, and they would steadily – just you could just see them improving and improving and improving, and the ones that, you know, and, and there's a there is you, you do have your your uh, group of kids out there that 
or laser focused on what they want to do, even at a young age. I understand. They're laser focused. Definitely. You know what I mean? I yes, was sir. laser focused. You were probably laser. <clears throat> I was laser focused and Same here. that's what they want to do is learn to play baseball. And so those particular kids shot through the roof. Um, and you had another group of kids that were focused on baseball, but they also did some other stuff outside. They continued to get better. And it was just kind of a stair step process. And, and um, so, so yeah, it worked out great and, and kids loved it. Um, uh, uh, I'm assuming the parents uh, thought I did a good job because I had, after my first year, I had more repeat guys than I had new guys. So um, hopefully I was doing something right. <laughs> well, yeah, one of my favorite lines from the movie Moneyball is when uh, Billy Bean and uh, Washington go to talk to uh, Scott Hattieberg, and Billy Bean tells Scott that first base is incredibly easy, and he says, tell him, Wash, and Wash, uh, Wash says, it's incredibly hard. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you, you talking about first base instruction. I've, I've played first base once or twice in a game situation, and I'm, I, yeah, I've also caught, and I think those are the two most dangerous positions on the field. It really takes some courage <laughs> to play those positions. So the, anticip <laughs> yeah, the, the anticipation of knowing where to go with the ball after it's hit to you with, with certain men on base first and second or, first, or second and third all that and then you and to be able to get in a cutoff position defense is a big deal big time absolutely 100 percent. Right. and that's the biggest thing is especially young kids they don't know where to go or what to do and even guys at this level um you know it takes them a minute to understand uh what a first baseman's actual job is and you know i, I tell i tell people that you know first base first base is is a doorknob job you know, a, a doorknob just sits there, does nothing until you got to go through that door. And then that door, that doorknob becomes extremely important. And I said, that's what people view first base as. People view first base as until that shortstop with a win and run at third throws one, you know, <laughs> five feet short. You got to pick, <laughs> you, pick um, it. <laughs> you know, and so now the doorknob becomes really, really, really important. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, that's just kind of a little analogy. I, I, I tell people, and, and uh, yeah, so yeah, it's uh, I'm enjoying it, and, and uh, I enjoy, like I said, I enjoy the game, and baseball consumes my life, and hopefully one day I'll get a, a shot at being a head coach at this at this collegiate level. Uh, going back to your career with the Texas Rangers, you spent your entire career with one organization, and that is uh, highly unusual nowadays. Tell me a little bit about being able to stay with one organization all that time. Uh, well, you know, I was drafted in 1990 on the 10th round out of the University of Montevallo, which at the time was an uh, NAI school, and there's a couple thousand people there. And, and uh, the old saying is, you know, I, I wasn't very, I, I couldn't, I wasn't a burner. I couldn't run real fast. <clears throat> I was average. I could throw okay, but what I could do is hit. And, you know, the old saying is, if you can hit, they'll find a place for you to play. Mm, absolutely. And back, you know, and back then, the Rangers uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, even uh, mid nineties, for, for uh, to an extent, they were. If you could hit, you could potentially play for the Rangers. If you go back and look at their lineups; that's what they were built around offense. And yeah. so I, I could hit. You know, I mean, you know that they were built around that offense. Um, Sierra, uh, 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 Franco, um, Kevin Reimer, all these oh, guys yeah, right, back right. then. You know, definitely, uh, and definitely right. And so. That's that's how I got drafted, and they 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 saw I could hit, and so and, and it's it's a situation where things work out um, because the right team drafted me, um, and and so just making my way through the minor leagues, and, and I was not one of these guys that, to be honest with you, it's, it's going to sound bad. Um, I was one of these guys that never thought I was going to get to the big leagues, so my job was to play minor league baseball. So I put my head down and did it. Um, and looked up one day and was on the roster, um, the 40-man the roster, then looked up one day and had an injury at the big league level and got called up and then looked up one day and I was eight years in. Um, and, and we can be honest, and it, it was eight years in because of my bat. Um, I could play defense, but um, I, was, I was a hitter. And, uh, uh, but being with one organization, that's kind of, uh, for me, that was by design. Uh, somewhat by design because I, I knew that Texas was the place that the place for me. I enjoyed 
the Rangers organization. I enjoyed the people in that organization. Still friends with some of them to this day. Um, I enjoyed Texas. I enjoyed the Arlington area. Uh, I live in Colleyville now, just right up the road. I enjoy that whole um, that whole area, and so I knew that was a spot for me. You know, and, and quite frankly, uh, how much is enough was my question. Um, I could have probably been a free agent and, and gone somewhere and signed a, a bigger contract, but I was comfortable with the money I was making more than comfortable with the money I was making. Um, and I'm not so sure, to be honest with you, that I would have been as successful elsewhere because of my my uh, love affair, so to speak, with the area, with the fans, with all that Absolutely. that was going on. I understand that um, big so, time. Yeah. Yeah, so I attribute my success a lot to to uh, the support um, that I received from the, the, the coaches in that organization, the front office in that organization, the fans that supported the organization. My success comes from uh, a major part of it comes from that. Well, uh, personally, on my side right here, being a, in baseball a long time, I enjoyed watching you play because you busted your tail every night. And you didn't you didn't show off. <laughs> I mean, I, right. I appreciated that big, a whole lot. Me too. And just, just watching somebody get out there, love of the game, playing hard and getting after it and, and actually contributing. So, uh, just want to thank you for that. I really do. Well, I, I appreciate that. And that, that lets me know I did something right. Well, you know, I learned from, I learned from guys, um, the Will Clarks of the world, the Mickey Tettleton, the Dave Valley. Mm -hmm. Um, I learned from those guys when I got, uh, to the big leagues. And then, uh, to be honest with you, uh, the way I viewed it was the guy that walked through the gate every night deserved my best. Um, first off, I wanted to give my best because of, of who I am and what I am. Um, I wanted to go out and perform. Um, but the guy that's paying my salary deserved my best every night. And I wish so, more. So I wish I more players. I wish more players mm-hmm. took that it, yeah. that point of view. Absolutely. I'm sorry to uh, in, interrupt you. Go no, ahead. no, you're you're good. Um, but and that's kind of the way I looked at it. And uh, and you know, it's I, I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like everybody. Um, I'm going to work uh, while for the, for the person that walks in the stadium, it's Major League Baseball. For me, it's it's a job. It's work. And I want to perform my best at what I'm doing for a couple of reasons. Myself, my team, my manager, my front office. Let's tell the truth. The next contract, but the fact, the guy that walks in that door, um, he, he, he just got on work. You know, he's coming to look for, he's coming to watch a game of baseball because he enjoys it and wants to see his favorite player, whoever it may be. You need to, you need to go out and do all you can do to, to, to satisfy that experience for that, that, that person who walks through those doors. Rusty, before we go, I want to ask you about your son, Mason. He played at McClendon Community College. That's where I got to see him for a couple of years. He's off to Missouri State. How's Mason doing nowadays? Uh, he's doing good. He's uh, he's actually playing first base for them every day, and, and uh, he's, he's uh, he never played first base <laughs> until last year and uh, for them and uh, did well. Um, but he's turned himself into a doggone good first baseman. Um, and that's uh, just through his his work. Um, he works as hard as anybody. And you know, it's it's. <laughs> I'm not the easiest uh, uh, dad when it comes to baseball. Because um, you're not because you're dad <laughs> and you play. Right. Uh, I play, and, and you know, sons and dads are anyway. Um, and and I, I give him uh, a big hats off because uh, you know he puts up with me and and he listens to me, but. Uh, he works his tail off, and and uh, he's turned himself into a really good first base. He's swinging the bat, he's uh, he's swinging the bat good. Uh, he's not getting a ton of hits right now, but uh, he, that'll change. His track record's too long to say it won't. Um, so so he's he's doing great. Um, he, he 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 likes the Texas weather though. When inning number one starts, because it gets a little cold up there in Springfield. Sometimes. <laughs> so, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> So, and you guys know how it is. You're trying to play baseball in the cold. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's terrible. It's baseball in cold weather doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Get, get jammed one time in cold weather. You oh, want yeah. to go home. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm all for exactly building more right. indoor stadiums. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I hear you. I well, hear you. So, Russ, 
Rusty, we do thank you for your time today. We know you're very busy. I think y'all got a, a game somewhere out of town today and let you get back on the road. But, again, thank you for your time and good luck down the, down the road. All right, guys. Thanks for the call. Yeah, did appreciate it. Thanks, Rusty. Bye. Bye-bye. That's our time for this episode of A Visit to the Mound. Many thanks to our special guest today, Rusty Greer, and thank you for listening. If you have any questions or comments or anything you would like for us to cover, we would love to hear from you. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Visit to the Mound or on our website at a visit to the mound.com. Make sure you like, subscribe, and review this podcast and be listening the next time we make A Visit to the Mound. This has been a Rogue Media Podcast.